Yeah, we'll just uh, we'll tell the editor, please start here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if if um, if if you're all okay, I I I could I could launch into it if you want. Is that all right? Yeah. Let's let's do it live. Yeah. Go Figure ahead. Figure out sharing screen to share. Is it coming through? Yep. Awesome. Okay, so we've come a long ways. Um, we're down to um, chapter 13, the 13th episode of this journey. Um, it's the predefined learning objectives here. The what we're gonna talk about real quick comes from the dials package and from Tune. Um, out of dials, we have ways of setting the parameters of different kinds of grids. So we'll, we'll talk about regular grids and, and then some irregular grids like random. We'll cover how the tune grid function runs where it, it takes that grid and, and explores the uh, sets of uh, tunable parameters. Um, we'll finalize a model. Um, We'll talk a bit about improving the efficiency. There are some types of machine learning models that uh, give you tuning for free. And so in those cases, uh, it's not so bad doing a regular grid because you, you get the other parameters. And, uh, and at the end, we'll explore one racing method um, why are we doing this? I guess ultimately um, this, this tuning step can be time consuming and really computationally expensive. And even though it's neat to make the fans run on the computer and you know, peg the CPU, it's, um, we, we need to get to the optimal result fast. And thoughtful choices in experimental design can, can uh, save a lot of time and get a, a good result much, much more quickly. This um, builds on last week. So we mentioned um, in last week's content, there was um, how to set tune uh, in, the, in the recipes. Um, this week is, is essentially setting parameters in advance. Um, and next week, we won't have time to get to it, but next week we'll look at uh, more iterative search methods. All right. Okay, so in uh, in in this content um, and and in the book example, he used a uh, neural network model, uh, um, uh, multi-layer perceptron, which I. I know almost nothing about, which made this a, a kind of a fun exercise. Um, the sorts of things that can be tuned here are the number of uh, hidden, hidden units uh, within the neural network, uh, the number of epochs, obviously, and the uh, penalization. Um, so in, in Parsnip, a, a specification for a, a model fit, um, is, is shown here with hidden units penalty and, and the tuning as, as tune. Um, they have a, an added argument on the engine about tracing that turns off the logging during the training process and makes it silent. Um, and, in, and in my case, I'm gonna do a regression. We'll, we'll look at the data set in a moment. When you set the specification, in this case, MLP spec. You can call parameters on the MLP spec um, and pull out the default, um, say, range for those parameters. So if, if, you, if you told MLP spec to, to do a tune grid um, with no other arguments whatsoever, 
it, it would run hidden units between one and 10 hidden units. Uh, on penalty, it actually, um, uh, penalties here are transformed by log, log 10. So it's 10 to the minus 10th all the way up to uh, a penalty of one. So that, that's something to keep in mind. And then uh, epics, the default is uh, between 10 and 1000 epics. So in the, in the simplest example, in a, in a regular grid, a, a rectangular grid, that's every combination. Um, in dials, you can call a grid regular on that parameter object say levels two, and, and it essentially gives the, the, the boundaries, the low and the high of each of the three um, parameters to, to arrive at eight combinations. And those are just the outermost. Um, obviously, uh, in this case, grid regular, um, you, can, you can call, um, a vector and, and get any combination, in this case, three, two, and two for a total of 12 combinations in your regular grid. And in this case, then it on hidden units um, sticks in the, 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 uh, the level in the middle. So it's, it's one, five, and 10 on hidden units. Um, they make a note here. Um, and it mentioned it before that uh, regular grids um, will go through every combination. And if, if, uh, if you get carried away with, uh, with levels, four or five, six levels on three different parameters, these, these numbers of models that are being run um, uh, gets pretty extreme. Um, we mentioned XGBoost earlier, things for which there are a lot of tuning parameters can be, can be expensive. Um, but, but there are a few kinds of models where there's uh, shortcuts, we'll, we'll get to that. One advantage of a regular grid, we'll see in the graphs, um, it's, it's obvious which combination yields what graph. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty clear as you move around the matrix how, how that influences your, your accuracy or your RMSC, um, you know, that, that, that uh, topology. Okay, we'll put regular grids aside for a second and think about irregular grids. The, the random one is the obvious one. Um, he notes here that um, random doesn't mean no overlaps. Um, they, they end up bunching up irregularly. Um, so, so even with 15 candidate points, they're, they're, the, these bunches don't necessarily correspond to the places where the RMSC is best. Um, he actually encourages folks to consider space filling designs, which um, have that say degree of randomness, but they make some attempt to um, fill out the, the, the uh, solution space in a way a regular grid did. The dials package has the Latin hypercube, which sounds really cool or um, the dials say default is maximum entropy. Um, okay, so just like grid random, the grid Latin hypercube, um, you give it a size dimension, it, it picks from that tune space, um, 15 combinations. Um, they, they are random, but they're not clumped together as uh, maybe as badly as, um, as purely random is. Yeah. 
And uh, I mentioned before, by default, Toon uses the max maximum entropy design. So um, I think we'll see more on that on the next page because it's what we ended up using in uh, evaluating the grid. So we'll go through an example with live data. Um, ultimately, the goal here on, um, on our cross-validated, say, slices of data is to, to run all of those grid combinations or the best ones and arrive at um, the one that we'll train the full model on. Um, so to work with this, I actually went to the feature engineering book and this um, um, readily available um, data set that looks at the um, ridership on the Chicago CTA at a bunch of stations. And what we're looking to do is uh, predict the ridership over time at the Clark and Lake Street station. Um, given uh, ridership at all the other stations 14 days before, along with some weather data and the sports team schedules in um, uh, that six or seven year time span. So just a quick, and, and in fact, <laughs> um, you can get the current version of this through the Chicago data portal if, if you care to, uh, but the, the, um, the data set itself, Chicago is in the model data package. So it's got uh, ridership, um, oh, a dozen or so um, data on ridership, two week lagged on a number of other stations, um, some temperature data. And you, you might imagine already, um, a number of these are highly correlated, like wind, wind max, even between stations, uh, Addison, Jefferson, it's likely on the same line that the ridership numbers from day to day are hugely correlated with one another. Um, just to prove a point, um, so I pulled ridership on uh, three rows of the data and then pulled the Clark and Lake um, 14 days uh, before and they're the same numbers. That the ridership figures themselves range from 600 to, to 26,000 a day, they're in thousands. Um, so in this example, just to make an illustration, um, I split the training and the testing data. I made um, cross validation folds. In this, in this case, um, given this is time dependent, um, actually did the folds in, uh, well, here, I'll show you a graph in, in eight slices where the, uh, the training data contains analysis and assessment and the test data is um, the most recent I guess the test is 2012 to, or 2012 to 2016, and the training is 2001 to 2012. Have I lost anybody? No, this is a uh, this is good. Good so far. Okay, so um, just like in the book, a um, lot of correlation between predictors. And uh, rather than spending time picking the best predictors, we're, we're going to use, uh, we're going to tune the PCA, among other things here. And just like he did in the book example, um, so we load the recipe, I've extracted day of week and month features, removed the date then, uh, as he did in his other data set, uh, we normalize, we do the PCA step and then normalize again because the higher rank PCA components by definition have less um, variance. 
I learned the hard way um, until these go away and they're all numeric predictors that um, you got to take the dependent variable out. Otherwise it won't, you can't use that to predict. So with that, um, built a workflow, multi-layer perceptron workflow. Um, uh, and, I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, are those steps for saying like minus ridership, like by design? I thought the formula method up top would like exclude that. All. Mm. I, I did too. I, uh, I did all this and then I, I got down to the predict step to look at my um, residuals, my errors. And, and yeah, it was normalizing my dependent variable and, okay. and that was bad. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. so I had to take it, take it out. Um, and, I'm, I'm wondering if that's like intended behavior or that's like a... It's a good question. Um, I do recall they had intended though to make this all numeric predictors. Ah, uh, right, right, yeah. I, re I remember John posting that in the the chat, like that was supposed to change. Okay, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I got so uh, annoyed with just the all numeric that I went ahead and downloaded like the uh, development version of yeah. uh, Parsnip. So I just, and I just use that now. I, I probably should, I, um, yeah. Okay, uh, another trick in the book, I guess in step PCA, if you set it at, if you set the number of components at zero, it doesn't do any PCA. Um, and one is one component up, up to 20 components. So um, here with the parameters call um, in dials, we'll update the boundaries. So it'll explore epics between 50 and 200 and number of components between zero and 20, rather than using the system defaults. So I have a, a parameter set. And then I think like one of the talks earlier in the earlier chapters, I just grabbed a whole bunch of metrics. I didn't grab all of them, but I was kind of interested in how they, um, how they tune different between RMSC and IIC and, and some of these others. Um, so tune grid is a lot like fit resamples was from previous chapters, but it adds um, the grid itself, like, like we talked above. And um, there's a param info, an optional, um, arguments that, that we'll use a little later for defining parameter ranges. Um, this, this grid thing uh, could point just to an integer like 10, and then you'd use uh, param info um, to, to describe other things so that when you say 10, there's, there's some sort of uh, you know, boundaries usually on, on the different tune parameters. Okay, so first pass, um, looked at a, a regular grid of three levels. So there's three parameters that's, uh, uh, well, in fact, there's a chart down here. So after you've run this and it takes several minutes to walk through all of the models, um, there's an auto plot function on the, on the tune. Um, where you can look at uh, for a regular grid, it's, it's a, a facet plot of every combination of parameters and, and on the right, every um, metric. I wonder, this, this is kind of small. Um, I'll, I'll move through this quickly, I, I guess. You can run this code yourself, but it's it's obvious with RMSC, like 
this this one in the middle with the with the blue line with with a with a penalty of one. Um, you know, 10 PCA components, 125 epics, um, has some nice qualities. And, and that was for, um, you know, whether it was two, seven, or even, even 10 hidden units. Um, a little argument could be made on the IIC metric. This, this red guy has the IIC is higher is better. Um, so, so in, in this case, there's a case where um, the smallest regularization maybe yielded the best result, but there's, there's some, um, say, candidates worthy of further investigation. Um, to look at the same range of the parameters, but use maximum entropy, um, because it's the default, you just say grid equals, you know, 20. The, it'll run the maximum entropy irregular combinations um, using the uh, parameters object we defined above. So the boundaries, the, the minimum and max of, of, of each of the parameters and, and with, the, uh, with the metrics we asked for. Um, What's a little weird here though, um, because it's um, maximum entropy and not a regular grid, when you auto plot the object, you don't get nice, um, um, it's, it's, it's not as clean in terms of knowing what your combinations of parameters were under each dot, if, if that makes sense, because I, I don't have nice looking facets. Um, because they don't all line up nice and tight, if that makes sense. Um, Max? Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I, I generally find these a little hard to to read, but I mean, I know they're, I see the purpose, but like you're trying to like correspond what one dot is across like all those different metrics um, yeah. and, you know, tuning parameters. And it's like, I don't know, if you turn this into a plotly, maybe it's a little easier, right? That we can highlight and kind of like sync all them together. I kind of think if you know nothing about the data, you might start regular to give you some sense of the, the width of the parameters, you know, what, what extent. But, but as you zoom in, you might use one of these other techniques. Um, he says, be really careful examining the plot. Um, because you don't know which dots correspond to which dots in the in the adjacent. So the amount of regularization and the number of hidden units, you know, this dot might correspond to. Oh, it's hard to say what what it corresponds to in the adjacent pane. Um, you can say show best, and that will give. Well, for IIC, for example, it will give the one with the highest IIC. And, and of course you could say metric is RMSE. But even there, he says it often makes sense to choose a suboptimal parameter combination that is associated with a simple model, simpler model. So that would mean in this case, larger penalty values and fewer hidden units. So it's a, it's a more compact neural network. Um, so when you've got the, um, you know, based on the grid, when you have the set of parameters you, 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 you'd like to take through to test, um, you'd use select best. You, you could make a tibble with the parameter settings you, you like. Um, either way, you'd plug those into finalize workflow um, so here I said select best with RMSE and model on the, um, so you create a, a final workflow on the whole training data set for those best parameters and, and run, a, run a fit on the entire training set. So that fit, 
um, can be used to make new predictions. So in, in my case, I predicted on the test data. Um, I binded back the, 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 the test data frame to, to get an RMNCE. You know, I'm within 3,000 riders. It's not a great model. Um, I thought, well, why is it not a great model? And, and um, I, I, uh, I really like that you can come back and pull out, you know, this, this is the predicted ridership, or excuse me, the actual ridership and the predictions. I colored them by, by day of the week and it's apparent. I've, I've got some problems on, looks like Fridays and Mondays. So there may be some other feature engineering available. Um, okay, and, and a note back here. Um, I, I probably spent an hour on this because, um, yeah, if the dependent variable is in the recipe in the wrong places, the predict on new test data, on test data won't work. It bumps, um, so I had to exclude the ridership variable. Oh, okay. Wait. So where do you have to exclude it? And uh, it's that's yeah, that's a good question. So that's that's where I I, I had to put this back here because oh, it the same on, issue with the all numeric predictors, right? All right, because you can't put the y variable. Uh, well, yeah, it, it's funny. Um, everything runs up until you try to predict, and then it crashes on test data because the uh, the ridership's not there. Right, which is probably why, like, um, when they switch it from all numeric to all numeric predictors, probably helps. Like, I, I guess, like. Yeah, I haven't run into that problem because I'm probably still stuck in carrot land where it's a little more stable. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I uh, but what I think we talked about this before, but with like with log transforms on the response variable, uh, do you have to do anything at that point? Like when you call predict, do you have to like exponentiate or uh, you know afterwards? I, or? I I think you have to right unless you. Unless it's like a step inside like a recipe to where when you do predict the recipe knows to unlog transform, you're just going to see the, the log transform of that predict. Um, obviously, we could probably test it out. Yeah, I, I, this is something I should just could do in like 10 minutes and yeah. I'm just too lazy to. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping someone I, has the answer readily. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. It's it's a good point to gut check that stuff though, and and um, you know make sure it makes sense. All right, so um, some tricks, and um, these things are also cool because they are super fast. You know, in, instead of waiting minutes or you know hours to run things, um, there's certain things that are free that you could just tune all the time and, and it really doesn't hurt your runtime. Um, you know, he cites partially squares and the number of components retained that's carried in the model. Um, in many cases, the number of trees is, um, or the boosting iteration, excuse me, which is often called trees, um, depending on the, um, the boosting system, sometimes that's a freebie. Um, Glimnet, uh, regularized regression, um, um, the, the penalty, the, the amount of regularization comes through uh, as a byproduct of the model. Um, Mars has a, a set of non-linear linear features or, or the retained content. In fact, um, in the tune package vignettes, um, they've actually got methods, um, this method called multi-predict identifies the models that have 
um, call them freebies. So for example, XGBoost here has freebies. And, and you could say um, method um, parsnip multi-predict XG booster formals names, and, and it would tell you which parameters um, automatically come through um, with, without adding um, uh, to, the, the, uh, to the number of items in the grid. In his example, um, they look at a C5, um, get a, a boosted model, um, and and um, where where trees is the freebie. Um, this is straight from his example. He's got the cells data set, and um, when he says trees equals tune. And, and tunes on um, all levels of trees from one to 100. Um, this thing runs in seconds. Um, that tune object then, if you auto plot it, um, this is a classification challenge. Um, you can get a sense of, of um, the number of trees and, and the impact on uh, area under the curve you know, so, so you could run this at, well, I don't know, 20 um, and, and know that 20 is the right answer really fast without, it's, it's really not running the model a hundred times. It, it gets that for free. I'm, uh, if I had more time, I, I, I'm curious, you know, on XGBoost to explore, you know, what to get for free as, as a time saver. Another time saver um, are the uh, parallel processing packages, depending on your um, operating system. Um, the ones that uh, Tidy Models takes advantage of includes um, Do Parallel and, um, and and the others like the Do Future and Do Parallel are probably the most common. Um, so in the tune object, in the tune grid object, um, there's implicitly a control grid setting or, or control resamples. And if, if you don't define the parallel over parameter, the default, if you leave it null, um, the default is to parallelize over resamples when there are um, cross-validation resamples. If, if there are not resamples, it, the, it falls back to everything. Um, he does mention here to be a little we weary of um, the random number of generation schemes. Um, switching from resamples to everything doesn't guarantee you get the same results. But if, if you leave the parallel over setting alone, um, that it is reproducible. Um, so to, to use this, this is really meant to be automatic. Just register the parallel backend and the computer should take care of it. Um, often in the backend though, you'll tell the computer, how many cores to use. Um, this is my own recommendation. Um, when I'm out on a virtual machine on a shared server, um, I'll set the number of cores to something like six. Um, the server may have 40 cores, but there are other users out there. I, I don't wanna take their machine, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I think this sort of thing, Julia Silge's code does the do parallel. She, she sets it up this way, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, another note on parallel, because it's pushing environment variables to each core, 
um, there are situations where, um, like in step PCA, um, we have to push the, um, um, we can't push the variable, we have to push the, uh, <laughs> the meaning of the variable. I haven't had this problem, I guess. Has anybody else? Uh, not in the tidy models, uh, like framework, but yeah, definitely just in regular deployer stuff. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've only seen it in shiny or regular deployer. It, it can also just be like a readability thing. Uh, so if you're like quickly reading through it, you're like, oh yeah, this isn't something that's in a data, like it's not an empty car, it's not a column empty cars, it's something that's looking up from outside the recipe. Yeah. Okay, um, so Max does a bit of a benchmarking discussion and, and I think it's, it's worth looking at, um, you know, saying parallel everything doesn't necessarily um, give you better performance. And, and so there's a reason the default is to parallelize just for the number of resamples. Um, he runs three, three situations where he's either pre-presses the, the data on, on um, in a dplyr, he's used a recipe with the steps, or he's done a recipe with a high computational cost. And um, so he's plotted execution time, higher is worse. And uh, say the number of workers, you know, he's run this several times with a different number of cores each time. And it's, it's interesting how the number of resamples and, and then the, the speed with everything is pretty much identical, you know, up to, up to five uh, workers here on a, on a machine with 10 phys physical cores. Um, there's not a lot gained, you know, when, when saying everything um, for the, the light duty workloads. Um, and, and on the expensive workloads, um, yeah, um, that there, there may be some rare situations where going to, to everything is worth it. Um, but he says, yeah, using parallel over everything is problematic since it never achieves the execution time that parallel over resample attains with, with a machine limited to five cores, like, like a laptop. If, if you happen to have a virtual machine in the cloud with 40 cores, um, results may vary. And, and that's just due to the, at least the, the pre-processing, right? In that, that right hand I'm channel. Sure. I'm sure, yeah, because it's got to set up every core with with uh, the libraries, the memory, um, the environment, e each core individually, and then pull them back together and, and knit all that back together. So, um, yeah. Okay, we're in the home stretch then. Um, racing methods. Um, this is still a grid search, um, but racing methods are a means of taking that grid and chucking some of the bad ones saying, just don't look there anymore. Um, so in a 25 or a 50 point grid search, um, it'll take um, a, a uh, a coarse sampling and throw out a third or more of the grid itself and focus in on the better performing portions of the grid. Um, its functionality comes from the fine tuning package. Um, so um, yeah, the, it fine tune takes a subset of the samples or, or, or models um, 
looks at course metrics, actually does what like a like a t test, and and throws away the ones that um, aren't going to make it. Um, racing methods. Uh, in fact, there's a video. I wonder if the video will play. So on this classification model, it, it essentially shows how um, it drops out a portion of the grid and no longer continues to zero in on the combinations in those areas of the grid. Um, so his argument here is that racing methods can be more efficient than basic grid search as long as the the interim analysis is fast and, and it's obvious there are some parameter settings that, that will never make it. Um, racing methods don't help when the model allows submodel predictions. So where we had those shortcuts before, racing methods and, and the shortcuts don't really work together. Um, Tune race ANOVA is the, the fine tune function that uh, is included. Um, like I said, it, it, it's like it pulls a, a t-test or confidence interval at each point. Um, here, I, I ran it against the Chicago data and, and did the auto plot. Um, you know, it's funny, the, the one that it hits eight times are, are the resamples that it's kept all the way through. But it, it does come up with a, uh, a show best combination of parameters that's not a lot different than, than what we've done before. Okay, so we're, we're at the end. Uh, just to recap the summary, we, we talked about regular grids that you build yourself, irregular grids like space filling designs and random grids. Um, looked at how to build the parameters manually or, or change the boundaries at least to use the grid functions. Um, we ran tune grid to evaluate the candidate sets. We looked at auto plot function on the, on the fit of the grid and show best to look at the top models. Um, we talked about fast submodel optimization with certain special kinds of models like C5 or XGBoost or uh, Glimnet. Um, looked at how to finalize a recipe. We pushed one all the way through to test to see how bad it was. Um, talked about parallel backend capabilities, a uh, little bit on fine, fine tune ANOVA. Um, and that's all I have for this week. What do we miss? Well, thanks, Jim. That was great. Yeah. I, have a, I have a thought. Um, well, that, something I didn't really totally understand um, on the submodel optimization. Um, I, I think I get the discussion. Um, I just, I'm, I'm curious, is this just like a de describing why packages like Glimnet like have a full grid of Lambda values uh, like it just makes it easier so that if you want to like predict on a bunch of lambda values uh, instead of you having to like explicitly create models for each of those packages will do this for you or is there like something inherent in the models that make it such that I don't know it's easy to run uh, you know a bunch of predictions on it uh, I guess I was confused by that discussion I think he said that that tune grid automatically knows that that model has that special capability, and um, and and so rather than running every combination, it it'll, it it gives you that um, as as part of um, of of that model. Mm. Yeah, so it's not like trying to reinvent the wheel. It's using uh, you know Glimnet's capability already to do that. Yeah, I think it's under the hood in Glimnet and it's certainly under the hood in XGBoost. 
Well, okay. What the, what that actually was, I, he was talking about number of trees, right? Uh, I, I guess both random forests and Xubus, don't they do that? Like they're, well, I guess Xubus, since it's bad, it's always building out trees. I, I mean, wouldn't, would random forests do the same thing, right? Like um, you give it a number of trees and it builds out for every number up to then? Or is that the, that's, that's the difference between like bagged and boosted, right? So actually boosted. I cumulatively like would build up to that point or it's bagged you know it takes a number and actually just tries that number without necessarily building up to that point i'm sorry if i confused <laughs> people I'd, I'd, i'm just kind i'd of have to go back here. i'd have to go back to the documentation on xg boost and on how it works but i think you're right yeah, it just seems inherent to the way like a boosted tree would work, right? Yeah. Yeah, actually, boost based on what I've read is one after the other, right? And it learns from the previous one. Yeah, I, I guess my my thought is like that's it's not dependent on actually boost the package. Just like literally like C five point right? Like that also has the capability to do boosted trees. I think so. It's just a, the nature of boosted trees, but not and not something specific to those packages. I have a peripheral question. Like, does anyone actually use race racing methods? I don't think I've ever uh, done that once. Yeah. Uh, Maybe that's I mean, more like monkey brain. Like, ah, I'm just gonna let it run and then get up and go grab a cup of coffee. Versus, I don't think I've ever run into a problem where I needed to use it. What about like you know we talked about Bayesian grid search before, or is that that's the next one? Iterative search, right? Yeah. Next week, yeah, fourteen. It seemed like. A, like a little like ad hoc way of doing iterative search. Um, I guess without like, well, well, I guess we'll talk about it more next week. Yeah, he has these um, like annealing methods and, and some of the Bayesian stuff that is, is yet to come. I had never seen racing used in this manner, I guess. Like, I, I mean, I guess I get, I get what it means now, right? Like it's trying to cut off like weaker parameters, like so that you don't need to even consider them um, and build out the model for them. Uh, I've always seen it just like in a more like software perspective, right? Like racing conditions where like two programs are running at the same time and then maybe have like the same output and they both can't like write to the same output. But I think- In this, this context, it sounds like it's more like pruning a, a, a tree model, yeah. right? Yeah. All right, who, um, was there a volunteer for next week? This is where Osmo starts volunteering people. Uh, no, it's, it's it's the part where we like sit in awkward silence, like until someone is uncomfortable enough to talk, which you know leads to the same thing. Oh, I believe she volunteered as tribute. Uh, winner. No, I, no, no, I seriously can't. I'm doing like I'm doing another presentation next <laughs> Thursday as well. Like I physically can't. <laughs> I can't come to the meeting next week. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I'll. We're going to be continuing this book beyond the chapters. Uh, let's see, screening. Like, I think we have TAN for screening many, many models, but I'll sign up for one of those next ones whenever. I, I, I think John mentioned it in the chat where we uh, 
they're writing the next chapters already. So I want to do one. It's just like I, I literally can't next week. <laughs> Or maybe yeah. maybe we can convince uh, Tan to switch it up. I don't know. Actually, that's probably uh, since he's not here, it's the person we could vote for. So I think we all collectively said Tan, and uh, uh, Godspeed to him when he gets this message. Uh <laughs> I mean, he said he wanted to do the last one because maybe it seemed a little easier. But honestly, I don't know if any of these are easy. Yeah, this one was like surprisingly. I felt it like was a lot denser than the chapter I presented. Oh um, yeah. Definitely denser than chapter two, which I presented. I did that on purpose. So I wouldn't have to do something <laughs> very dense. All right. Well, I'm about to message uh, the group chat and put Tan's name in here. Uh, yeah. So Tan. That's what he gets for not showing up. We have come to consensus, and you are voted next top presenter. <laughs> I'm sure you won't hate Our party symbol in there. Um, But uh, you presented this really well. Like I read this yeah. right before and it was like a good mix of like, you know, reviewing the details, but also in injecting your own kind of a commentary in there, which, you know, I, I always strive for when I try to review this stuff. So. I, yeah, when you guys have presented in the past, I, I really enjoyed it when you stick in some other crazy data set and see what happens. I, I like that too. I was just trying to get the meme count up because I had to follow Tony and uh, <laughs> kind of blew me out of the water. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, overall as a group, we're doing really well. Like, I feel like everyone's picking it up. Cool. All right. So, uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jim, for presenting. It's yeah. my pleasure. Thanks, Jim. All right. Always yeah, great talking to you guys. Bye-bye. See you in a week. There you go. Thanks, everyone.